Hello. Hello. Good morning. Welcome back. We are Everything with the Girls. I'm Grace. And I'm Lydia. We're going to have a double whammy today. So we're doing Kellyanne Bates and we're doing the Kobe, Kobe. I think it's pronounced Kobe. The Kobe Child Murders. Oh, I <laughs> I pronounced it as Kobe, you know, like Kobe Bryant. <laughs> Kobe. Kobe. Yeah, so, Kobe. So yeah, Kobe. I mean, oh, yeah. K-O-B-E. It's a place in Japan. If you know, you know. If you don't, you don't. Whatever. You like the Japanese cases recently, right? I know. Well, I actually found this case from um, the Junko Furusa case. So okay, make of that what you will. Whether or not they're similar, I don't know. Okay. So I'm just going to jump straight into it, yeah? This week we're talking about a case police described as the worst example of abuse they had ever seen. That's always an exciting way to start, isn't it? Mm-hmm. So in April 1996, I was born. Oh, Jesus Christ. No, I know. I know. I know. <laughs> But it's also, always April. <laughs> oh, I just read the next sentence, so maybe I shouldn't have brought up the fact that I was born. <laughs> it also saw the horrific torture and murder of 17-year-old Kellyanne Bates at the hands of her boyfriend of three years, 49-year-old James Patterson Smith. Sorry? Yeah, you read that right. Prior to her death, Kellyanne had suffered shocking injuries, including scalding of her buttocks and legs, stab wounds inside her mouth, and mutilation of her body. Wow. I mean, I don't really know what to say. Oh, it gets worse. Now this is my turn this week to shock you. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So there is a warning. Lydia's put a warning in. It says the details of this yeah. case and the injuries are graphic. So if you want to skip a few seconds forward when we get to that and bit. It is domestic violence as well. So that could be a trigger for some people. So TW, just... trigger warning. Yes. But what's quite uh, interesting is that Kellyanne was only 14 when she met him. So Okay, so this guy's a paedophile, yeah? 100%. Oh, 100%. And a groomer. Mm-hmm. Okay, when you put, I don't know, I know it says at the top the murder of Kellyanne Bates, but I was thinking Kellyanne Bates was the bad person in the story, so I'm already, (laughs) already I'm not with him. Yeah, so it is going to be a short one this week, because unfortunately, as much as we love to do cases that you don't really know about, and we don't really know about, there's normally a reason for that, so there wasn't much information on this that I could find. If you, whoever's listening, if you know of other factors of the case that we haven't talked about, let us know. Because we're always open for learning more. Yeah. Right? And squeaky chair's back, so just expect it now, I suppose. Because I ain't changing it. So Kellyanne Bates was born on the 18th of May, 1978, in Hattersley, a small town in... Tameside, 10 minutes east of Manchester city centre. Parents Margaret and Tommy were thrilled to be gifted with a beautiful child who would later grow into a confident and independent 14-year-old. As I've just said, we couldn't really find much uh, information on Kelly herself. Unfortunately, with cases like this, it does surround the offender and not the victim, which I don't personally agree with. Like, you give too much light to the offender, I think, in, in a lot of cases and not enough to victims. Um, but we can't do anything about that really can we so let's just carry on yeah Jane Smith was an unemployed divorcee living in the Gorton area in Manchester described by acquaintances as house proud and well groomed he was a teetotaler and a non-smoker his marriage had ended in 1980 after 10 years because he had been violent towards his wife his next relationship was with a 20-year-old Tina Watson, whom between 1980 and 1982 he used as a punch bag, even subjecting her to severe beatings while she was pregnant with his child. She said, quote, At first it was now and again, just a little tap, but in the end it was every day. He would smack me in the face or hit me over the head with an ashtray. He would kick me in the legs or between the legs. Watson managed to escape from the relationship, during which Smith had also attempted to drown her while she was bathing. Wow. 
he's a piece of shit. That's what we've learned already. And we'll mm-hmm. carry on learning about. When that relationship came to an end in 1982, Smith then started seeing 15-year-old Wendy Mottishead, whom he also abused. In one attack, he had held her underwater in the kitchen sink in an attempt to drown her. Okay, so they're getting younger and younger. Yes, they are indeed. And um, you want to see a picture of him? Yeah. There's my phone. Let's show you a picture of him. He's probably really ugly. Oh my god, is he going to be really handsome? Uh. <laughs> Ew, uh. Okay, guys, can confirm he's ugly. U G L Y. He ain't yeah. got no alibi. He's it's such a classic. Awful. Do you know what? He is actually a classic looking paedophile. I was just thinking that he's a classic paedophile. That's the only That's what he looked like when he was younger. So yeah, we can confirm he looks like a stereotypical paedophile. Yeah. Right. And it's not nice to use stereotypes, but he is a paedophile, so let's use one on this one. Yeah, also I can guarantee you all know what we're talking about. You have got an image in your head, so don't act like we're the judgmental ones, because I can feel you all judging him too. Blame society, not us. (laughs) (laughs) So, the relationship, and we're going to put relationship in quotation marks, because she wasn't of an age of consent, so it's not a relationship in my book anyway. Don't know about you? No. Okay, cool. Glad we're on the same page. So, in 1993, Smith began grooming Kelly Bates when she was only 14 years old, having met her while she was babysitting for friends. Approximately two years later, when she left school, Bates moved in with Smith at his home in Furnival Road, Gorton. So he's taken two years to groom her, basically, and then mm. she's moved in with him. It's not like these he's met her, waited two years, and then say, oh, okay, we can be together now. Like, Which also wouldn't be okay, because she's still only 16 years of age. <laughs> you know what I mean? She was concealing the age difference between them from her parents, Tommy and Margaret Bates. Kelly was a mature, bubbly girl, and a lot of her friends were already older than her. So for her mother, Margaret, it was no surprise when at 16 years old, the teenager told her that she had an older boyfriend. Quotes. That's all she That's all she let on. She let on. However, Bates' mother said of her first meeting with Smith after the two had started living together, quote, as soon as I saw Smith, the hairs on the back of my neck went up. I tried everything I could to get Kelly away from him. It's not going to happen, is it? Like... Especially the teenagers, when you tell them you can't do anything, they're going to do it. That must be Even such a mom. horrible feeling to be like a mum. It's probably the worst <clears> position <throat> to be in as a mum, isn't and it? And see like, your daughter with someone that you don't want them to be with. Yeah. Although she had left Smith briefly because of arguments with him, she was once more living with him at Furnival Road by the end of November 1995. Her parents noticed bruises on her, which she explained away as a result of accidents. She became increasingly withdrawn and in December 1995, she resigned from her part-time job. In March 1996, her parents received cards from her for their anniversary and birthday, but only Smith had written in them. When Bates' brother tried to see her at the house, Smith said she was not at home, and when a concerned neighbour asked after her, she was only briefly shown at the upstairs window. So this guy is like full-on practically holding this poor girl hostage yeah we'll get into what he was doing holding her hostage but it's just bloody awful if you ask me so on the 16th of april 1996 smith reported to authorities that he had accidentally killed his girlfriend during an argument in a bathtub claiming that she had inhaled water and died following his attempts at resuscitation yeah okay hon Pretty sure that's not how it goes. If you're trying to resuscitate someone, it's because you're trying to bring them back to life, not Who kill them. Who the fuck inhales water? <laughs> also, we tried to fucking drown two other girls in water, so we can see a mm-hmm. link here. Well, we we go on to how his story just doesn't hold up. Okay. He also claimed that she often pretended to be unconscious. Police went to Smith's address and found Bates's naked body in the bedroom. Her blood was found throughout the house and a post-mortem examination revealed over 150 separate injuries on her body. During the last month of her life, she had been kept bound, sometimes tied by her hair, to a radiator or furniture, or by her neck by way of a ligature. Wow. 
William Lawler, the Home Office pathologist who examined her body, said, quote, In my career, I have examined almost 600 victims of homicide, but I have never come across injuries so extensive. In the four weeks leading up to her death, Bates had been burnt with cigarettes and branded on the thigh with a hot iron. Boiling hot water had been poured over her feet and her bum. She had multiple stab wounds caused by knives, forks and scissors. Stab wounds were even found on the inside of her mouth. Oh. Mm-hmm. A ligature mark on her neck indicated that she had been strangled and she had been tied to by her hair to a radiator. At some point during the four weeks, her hands and kneecaps had been crushed. Fucking hell. You could have given me a pre-warning. <laughs> You did this with me in the last episode, mate. (laughs) Rendering her unable to walk and therefore unable to escape. She had been partially scalped. Oh, my God. Her ears, nose, mouth, lips and genitalia had been mutilated. Both of her eyes had been gouged out and her empty eye sockets had been stabbed. What the fuck? How is he trying to say she drowned? Obviously, no domestic abuse is normal, right? And it's, but this is like on a whole other fucking level. Hang on. The pathologist determined that her eyes had been removed not less than five days and not more than three weeks before her death. She was alive when he did that. Ugh. Oh my fucking God. Mm-hmm. Why did you not warn us? Actually, you did. I, I mean, I did. <laughs> wow. But also, how are neighbours not hearing all this going on? Because I, there is absolutely no one on this planet who would stay quiet when that's happening to I them. wonder, though, if you stop and screaming it's not after fault, a certain but... amount of time. I mean, I obviously wouldn't know. I mean, I suppose she probably eyeballs. lost consciousness. Yeah. yeah. But know. even so, if someone's putting a hot iron on your leg, you're not being silent. Like, the people in this society need to be more nosy, if you ask me. Because if I'm here screaming from next door, Who I'm calling the police for a wellness check. Gouges someone's eyes out. Mm-hmm. What the actual fuck? Mm-hmm. So, Kelly had been starved and hadn't been given water for several days before she died. Before she drowned, she had been beaten over the head with a shower head. Her death must have been merciful, the jury would have been told. Bates's father, Tommy, had the grim task of identifying his daughter's body. Her mother stated, quote, People called him an animal, but an animal wouldn't do that to another animal. He is a very evil man. I think about how much pain she must have been in, how she must have thought we didn't love her because we didn't save her. Peter Openshaw, the prosecutor in Smith's trial, stated, It was as if he deliberately disfigured her, causing her the utmost pain, distress and de- degradation. The injuries were not the result of one sudden eruption of violence. They must have been caused over a long period and were so extensive and so terrible that the defendant must have been deliberately and systematically torturing the girl. The cause of death was drowning, immediately prior to which she had been beaten about the head with a shower head. Openshaw said that her death must have been a merciful end to her torment. I mean, he's not wrong, is he? I mean, it's really, it's reminding me of Junko Furuta. Yeah, it's just... It's wow. one thing. And I came yeah, I into this, this week. thinking he was just going to be a paedophile. I know. And I said this with uh, Junko Furuta's case. It's one thing to just to kidnap and attack and rape and kill. But to torture another human being, mm. that takes like evil on another level. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. That's where I, I personally think... That that this crime is worse than some serial killers' crimes mm. because they didn't play with their victims. Do you know what I mean? Because that's what it is. It's it's like when let's bring the animal kingdom into this. But you know when you see uh, killer whales, they play with the the seals and the penguins yeah. before they kill them. Mm. Like it's just there's not enough time to give someone for a sentence to get justice for this. I don't know. Smith denied murder and claimed Bates would put me through hell winding me up. Okay, she deserved it then, did she? Yeah. (laughs) Like, he also claimed that Bates had taunted him about his dead mother and had a bad habit of hurting herself to make it look worse on me. 
stereotype. He's just he's just victim blaming. Helping us stereotype him, isn't he? Mm. Like, let's start victim blaming, right? <sighs> when asked to ex- explain why he had blinded, stabbed, and battered Yates, he said that she had dared him to do it, challenge him to challenging him to do her harm. Gillian Mezzi, a consultant psychiatrist, told the court that Smith had, quote, a severe paranoid disorder with morbid jealousy and lived in a distorted reality. The evidence presented at trial was so disturbing that every member of the jury accepted professional counselling afterwards. The jury of seven men and five women took just one hour to find James Smith guilty, sentencing him to life imprisonment. The judge, Mr Justice Sachs, recommended that Smith served a minimum of 20 years. He stated, This has been a terrible case, a catalogue of depravity by one human being upon another. You are a highly dangerous person. You are an abuser of women and I intend so far as it is my in my power that you will abuse no more. The jury were provided professional counselling to help them deal with the distress of seeing the photographs of Bates' injuries and sickening violence of the case. Isn't that scary that he was given a minimum of 20 years? He's probably out now. I know. Well, yeah. But I suppose it's minimum and then they have to review it, don't they, to see whether he's still a danger to society or but something. If you're, I mean, if you're a lifer, like, as long as he's been well-behaved in there, he'll get out on minimum terms. I mean, and I suppose, why wouldn't he be well-behaved? Because it's violence against women is his That's trigger. So, so scary to think that he might be out. Unless it's against a female pre- prison officer, he isn't coming in contact with females. Because or, like, a nurse that works there. Like... Crazy. So that's it. That's it. That's the tiny, tiny case. It's a bit gruesome, yeah. but it is interesting. And I think we all agree that we need to watch out for people called James Smith. <laughs> Just as a general rule of thumb, he might be there. He might be out there. Action. <laughs> 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 Hello and welcome back. So, I'm sure none of you have heard of this case, but it's very interesting and there are definitely some similarities to this one in Junko. Okay. So, I'm just going to jump straight into it. Also, um, disclaimer it's obviously a Japanese case, lots of Japanese names. I'm not Japanese. Neither I don't am speak I. Japanese. <laughs> don't really do know I. much about it the language or anything so i'm gonna butcher some of these names and places but whatever okay i mean we all know i'm gonna fuck it up at some point so (laughs) so on march the 16th 1997 ayaka yamashita age 10 was bludgeoned to death with a steel pipe we're going straight in okay we're just jumping in there right okay on May 27th, 1997, the head of Jan Hayes, a special education pupil in Tianohata Elementary School, was found by a school janitor in front of the school gate hours before pupils arrived for class. Hayes had been beheaded with a handsaw with further mutilations done before being left in front of the school for students to discover when they arrived in the morning. A note written in red pen was found stuffed in his mouth, identifying the killer as um, Sakakibari, Sakakibara, I think, which is basically, when I googled it and tried to figure out what it meant, it's just a really common Japanese surname, okay. like Smith. It's like Smith, yeah. Yeah. So it doesn't actually identify the killer as anyone. So in the note, it says this. This is the beginning of the game. Try to stop me if you can, you stupid police. I desperately want to see people die. It's a thrill for me to commit murder. A bloody judgment is needed for my years of great bitterness. Police commented that the style of Hayes's killing and the note was reminiscent of that of the Zodiac murders in San Francisco during the 1960s. There were all these weird symbols over the letters, kind of like a cipher. Um, Also, the two crimes, while not linked, had different MOs, just like the Zodiac killer. Why does that note make me think that it was, like, not a child, but, like, maybe someone of a 
certain mental age. You know what I mean? It's well, kind of like oh, we'll catch you well. Again. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's like oh, oh, you stupid police! I hate you. Blah blah yeah. blah. I'll show you. Cool. You hate the police. Why? Did, why are you chopping people's heads off just because you hate yeah. the police? Yeah, I get what you mean. <clears throat> so on the sixth of June, a letter was sent to the newspaper um, Kobe Shinbun, in which Saka Kibara claimed responsibility for the slaying and decapitation of John Hayes and threatened that more killings would follow. This second letter, delivered in a brown envelope postmarked June the 3rd, had no return address or name, obviously. I mean, yeah. (laughs) Enclosed was a three-page, 1,400-word letter, which is a big essay, which is also handwritten in red ink. I mean, I'm not being funny. I can't be bothered to write three pages in handwritten so the letter included a six character name that can be pronounced as Sakakibara Sito. The same characters which also mean alcohol, devil, rose, saint and fight were all used in the first message that was inserted in Jun Hase's mouth. So it's a bit like link like the Zodiac Killer, you know, with all the Yeah, symbols. they've definitely like watched the Zodiac or like yeah. <laughs> It's it, there's definite um, inspiration there, isn't there? Hundred percent. Did they catch him? Well, let's see. Okay. Beginning the phrase. Um, now is the beginning of a game. The letter stated, "I am putting my life at stake for the sake of this game. If I'm caught, I'll probably be hanged. Police should be angrier and more tenacious in pursuing me. It's only when I kill that I am liberated from the constant hatred that I suffer." and that I am able to attain peace. It is only when I give pain to people that I can ease my own pain. The letter also lashed out against the Japanese education system, calling it compulsory education that formed me an invisible person. In the initial panic, the Japanese media misreported his name as Onibara, which means demons rose, though the killer insisted that he gave it correctly in the letter. Infuriated by this mix-up, Sakakibara later wrote to the station. Now this is a quote, so don't come for me, okay? From now on, if you misread my name, to spoil my moods, I will kill three vegetables a week. If you think I can only kill children, you are greatly mistaken. So... <laughs> that... Uh... Okay... I mean, I don't really know what to say to that. It's bad. So, obviously, by vegetables, he means mentally disabled people. Yeah. But it's also what I didn't realise when I was first researching it is Jun Hayes, the boy that he beheads, he goes to a special education school. So he chooses the most vulnerable people So he picks Jun Hayes because he's disabled. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, what we say, here, I don't know I don't if that's know, the right word. I'm trying well, very, very hard not to say anything offensive. Mm. But yeah, police mobilised over 500 investigators to work on the grim murders, while concerned parents organised neighbourhood watches and children were escorted to and from school. The case sent shockwaves across Japan as they tried to figure out who was doing this. I mean, this is basically the zodiac. Yeah. 30 years later. Like. And what's with, like, what I find about like, Japan is that it's, actually, it's got quite a low crime rate. But yeah. When it does have a violent crime, like, it's next level violence. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, it's from one extreme to the next. Mm. There's no middle, middle ground for crime. Yeah. Like, yeah. On June the 28th, a 14-year-old junior high school student was arrested as a suspect in the Hayes murder. Hayes, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Shortly after his arrest, boy A also confessed to the murder of the 10-year-old Ayaka Yamashita on March the 16th, as well as assaulting three other girls around the same time. So it was a child. Fucking mate, I could salt. I could yeah. do this. So you were right. I, 
I should maybe go on that Channel 4 show. I'd be fucking brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> so Kakakibara began carrying out carrying cutting weapons while still in elementary school, writing in his diary that I can ease my irritation when I'm holding a survival knife or spinning scissors like a pistol. Okay. This kid this kid this kid needs help. Like mm. Fucking hell. At age 12, he showed signs of extreme cruelty towards animals, lining up a row of frogs in the street and riding over them with his bicycle, as well as mutilating cats and decapitating pigeons. In addition to this, friends who knew him stated that his hobbies included collecting cats' eyeballs and tongues. I mean, he if he hadn't wrote that letter and been such a egotistical wanker, let's, let's term it that way, he would have gone on to kill so many more people. Yeah. Because this is like... Isn't it again, fucking mental to think at the age of 14 he decapitated I someone? I know. Exactly. That's but it, mental. Obviously, it's already horrendous what he did, but it would have been so much worse. Mm. Like, yeah. After the March 16th attacks, he wrote in his diary, I carried out sacred experiments today to confirm how fragile human beings are. I brought the hammer down when the girl turned to face me. I think I hit her a few times, but I was too excited to remember. The following week, on March 23rd, he added, This morning, my mum told me, Poor girl. The girl attacked seemed to have died. There is no sign of my being caught. I thank you, Bam Audio Kishin, for this. Please continue to protect me. And you thought that we don't know what the identity of this is, so it's probably all in his head yeah, anyway. So he writes in his in his diary like, "Thank you, Bam Audio Kishin," and then I googled it, and no one knows who the fuck it is. It's not God. It's not a person. It's nothing. So I don't know. He's. It seems like. It could be a handle. I mean, obviously, I know this is the 90s, so social media isn't a thing. But it could be a handle. You know what I mean? You know when they don't really make sense? It reminds me of, like, the Babadook. Yeah, yeah. So it it reminds me of, like, a demon or something, maybe, but I don't know. Or maybe it's, like, something he's heard in passing and it's a miscommunication. He thinks it said this, but... Mm. Or he hasn't been able to spell it or something. Yeah. The personality profile of Sokaki Bara is seen to be a case of... Ugh, why do you do this to me? Honestly. Hikikomori. Hikikomori syndrome. This syndrome, first described in, D- in Japan, is also known as social withdrawal syndrome. And it can be defined as the state of confining oneself to one's house for a significant period of time and limiting communication with others. Is that me? Yeah, I mean, that just sounds like my life. I mean, fair, yeah. <laughs> Is Whatever. it a syndrome? I thought this was just lockdown. <laughs> the worst thing about this case is that people might have seen it coming. Yet neither of his family, nor Japan, heeded the telltale signs. Japanese children are confronted with an extremely difficult exam at the age of six. This determines their whole futures. I would have shared this. It decides the, <laughs> it decides the school they go to and what kind of education they will receive. Parents often have a, have little to no faith in the state school system, and Sakaki Bara's mother was no exception. She pressured her son to excel in school and pass these exams, even though social workers warned her that her son was mentally unstable. He was already torturing animals as a hobby at this point. I mean, that's something I've heard as well. That cult, like Japanese culture, weird, especially it? and Chinese like, culture, is the oh, pressure that they put on. Yeah, and it like churns out all these people that are exactly the same, and mm. eventually someone cracks. Mm. It's it's weird, isn't it? Yeah. So, after the murders, Japanese politicians called for a restriction. Um, called for restricting objectionable 
content after a search of Saki Kabara's room turned up thousands of manga volumes and pornographic videos of an anime, stating that movies lacking any literary or educational merit made for just showing cruel scenes, the adults should be blamed for this, and that the the incident gives adults the chance to rethink the policy of self-imposed restrictions on these films and whether they should allow them just because they are profitable. Sakakibara was sent to the Special Medical Reform- Reformatory for Juvenile Offenders in Fuchu, Western Tokyo, in October 1997, to receive psychiatric treatment and counselling. He was transferred to an ordinary reformatory in 2001 to learn social skills. On March the 11th, 2004, in an unprecedented act, the Japanese Ministry of Justice announced that Saki Kibara, 21 at that time, was going to be released on a provisional basis, with a full release to follow on January the 1st, 2005. Critics suggested that due to the announcement, Saki Kibara was likely not fit for release. Why else would the Ministry of Justice inform the public of this event? Because mm. that's not a thing they normally do. Oh, okay. Due to the seriousness of the crimes and the fact that they had been committed by a minor, his name and new residence to this day remains highly guarded. However, his real name has been circulated on the internet since 1997, and we know it as Shinichiro Azumu. I think. I've butchered that name. But you can find (laughs) it. It's like, you can find it. Um, A number of people insist that Boye was wrongfully accused and point out certain contradictions in his statement of the investigating authorities. For example, police investigators said that one of the murders was made by a left-handed person. Boy A was right-handed. Boy A's confession contained many absurd statements and claims of things that would be impossible for a 14-year-old to do. And Boy A had bad grades, but his confession was complex and contained many elaborate figures of speech and similes. Uh, I don't think those last two are contradictions. I don't think any of them are because, contradictions. Yeah, because you can't justify you, it. you highly... can't you can't say firstly you can't say someone a murder was committed by someone with their left hand because I could I could murder someone with my left hand. You no, know, yeah, but it it depends what wounds were caused that they've examined to say. But you can or you can always tell if someone's gone say they're left handed if they've gone right to left, like slashed. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Mm. And if that's not their dominant hand, the pressure would be different. Um, but that 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 determination is, is got to be based on a number of different factors. So to say that, oh, well, he's only right-handed, he might be happy, happy to, oh, what's the word? We need both. He might use both hands. Yeah. Um, and then, like, just because someone is highly intelligent and they use elaborate figures of speech and similes that doesn't mean it's going to equate into their academic stu- studies mm. like you find that highly intelligent people so a lot of the time they don't do well in an academic setting yeah because they can't deal with that structure mm. and that's just not how they learn um and then what could possibly be impossible for a 14 year old to yeah do? because he fucking chopped off someone's head, so I don't think exactly. anything's impossible for him. You can't say anything's impossible for anyone, do you know what I mean? Nothing's impossible, babe. Exactly. Like, everyone as individuals is so different. To, so what's impossible for me, you might be able to do, and vice so versa. He, I don't know really why. The people have claimed that he was wrongfully accused, but he's he's confessed to it. He admitted to his mum that he did it, like... He has never said, I, I'm innocent. So mm. these people trying to get him, like... But, like, it's it would be sort of easy to rule him out if he hadn't done it. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. But having said that, in other cases, it's not. Yeah. So they still get sent down. But I don't know. Um, yeah, and I mean, as we've seen in the James Bolger case, nothing's impossible. And underestimating and anyone who was that is girl, the Mary worst Bell. thing you can do. Yeah. Like, children can do horrible stuff. We've, yeah. We've, we know that. 
Never underestimate anyone and their capabilities of doing anything. So, in June 2015, then aged 32, Saki Kibara released an autobiography titled Zeka, in which he claimed to express regret for his crimes and recounted the murders in graphic detail. Despite attempts by John Hayes' family to block this release, it quickly reached the top of the Japanese bestsellers list. That's so bad. I actually looked it up and it's, you can only get it in Japanese, but it's actually a real so thing. Bad. I know. And how can you express remorse and then detail the crimes in and, a book and earn money off yeah, it? Yeah, and then earn money off it, exactly. It's not like he's put all the money's earned back into a charity or something or given it to the families. If mm. you really regretted what you did, that's what you would do. You would try mm. and get redemption almost. Mm-hmm. So you'd you give the money to the families. It's never going to be enough, but <laughs> yeah, I don't know. But that's that, I'm afraid. That's another, it's very little, but it's gory. Yeah. But unfortunately, there's not much on it online. I don't know if that's because he was a child when he did it or maybe it's because there's not it's from japan so that people don't really want to talk about it as much Mm. but yeah it is frustrating though like with when you find these small cases that are so interesting Mm. and you do actually just want to learn more about it Mm. you can't Mm. (laughs) the resources aren't there like but um yeah so it's a new format for some episodes, I suppose. We've never done this before, have we? Yeah. So, um, yeah. We hope you enjoyed both episodes. It would probably made more sense if they were sort of related in some way, but yeah. they're not. <laughs> we're just going with it, though. Yeah. <laughs> we had to record something for this week, so we thought there's no point in giving you a 15-minute episode of one thing, so let's give you a half-hour episode of two things. Let's do two. Yeah. Um, so we hope you enjoyed. If you did, follow us, subscribe, review, and what else? Like, like, and like. Likey. Yeah. Um, you can find us on Instagram at Everything with the Girls Pod, and yeah. So we'll be back next week with another episode, Woo-hoo. and something very exciting possibly coming soon, but. Let's just build the tension up for that, shall we? Okay, gotcha. (laughs) You're like, what do we have coming soon? Yeah, I'm thinking, what is she talking about? This woman has so many plans in her head. I I just, I just rock up, to be honest with you. It's just my personality type. I like to plan for things, okay? Yeah, that's true. Right. Yeah. See you later. Bye.